Um, Attack Surface just came out on Tuesday. It's a standalone novel set in the same world as New York Times bestsellers, uh, Little Brother and Homeland. Washington Post calls it a riveting techno thriller and says the book charts the universal currents of the human heart and soul with precision. No big deal there. Um, uh, here to discuss the book and some of its themes are Malkia Devit Surreal and Meredith Whitaker. Uh, Malkia Devit Surreal is the founding executive director of Media Justice, a national hub for racial justice, rights, and dignity in a digital age. After almost two decades of leadership, Malkia now serves as a senior fellow at the organization. Meredith Whitaker is the Nindaroo Research Professor at NYU and the co-founder of the AI Now Institute. She's a longtime tech worker whose research and organizing focuses on corporate tech power and the social implications of AI. And Corey Dottereau is a novelist, a journalist, and an internationally known human rights activist. As a journalist, he's a regular contributor to The Guardian, Locus, and many other publications. As an activist, he's known for his critiques of copyright abuse, of technological monopolies and monopsonies, and of all uses of technology to build dystopian systems of unchallengeable privilege. His award-winning novel, Little Brother, was a New York Times bestseller, as was its sequel, Homeland. His 2019 novella collection, Radicalized, uh, for which we also had the pleasure of, of hosting, um, is one of five finalists for 2020 CBC Canada Reads program. Uh, born and raised in Canada, he lives with his family in Los Angeles. And um, before we get started, I want to uh, call your attention to the chat window at the top right of your screen, um, which I'll be uh, mo uh, monitoring shortly. Um, uh, there, um, you can uh, show Corey, Malkia, and Meredith some love. Um, let us know where you're tuning in from. And of course, if you have any questions at all throughout the program, um, please ask there. And um, we'll have time for a Q&A at the end of the program. Uh, so without further ado, um, welcome, Corey. Congratulations on the book. And uh, Malkia and Meredith, thanks so much for joining us. I'll turn it over to all of you guys. Thank you very much. And thanks to the booksmith. You know, my, my first novel, Down and Out in the Magic Kingdom, came out in 2003, and the booksmith ho hosted a launch for it. And I don't know if they still do it, but in those days, they used to do um, trading cards for the authors that did launches there. And so I still have my booksmith trading card. It's, it's uh, very much a treasured uh, memory of mine. So uh, the order of service here tonight is I'm going to read a very brief passage from the novel, uh, Attack Surface. And then I have some questions for our guests. They are uh, really interesting folks who do important activist work that makes a difference in the world and that inspired the kinds of uh, stuff that went into the book, uh, uh, Attack Surface. And um, they know a lot more about this stuff than I do. They're much more at the coal face than I am. And so I'm really looking forward to getting their points of view. And then we'll take your questions. So I'm gonna to read to you briefly now. Um, it's, this is a, a passage that describes the protagonist of the book, uh, a woman named um, uh, Masha Maximov, who uh, is a surveillance contractor who's had a comeuppance. She's, she's realized that her life's work is not something she's proud of. And she's come back home to America from the former Soviet Republic, where she's been helping crush democratic revolutions on behalf of dictators, and discovered that her friends who are active in racial justice struggles there are being targeted by the same cyber weapons that uh, she was building uh, overseas. Um, she and her friend Tanisha have gone to uh, buy new phones after their phones were compromised and they've run into the hero of the first two books, uh, uh, Marcus Yallo and his wife now, Angie, and rather uh, Carvelli, and they are taking the train home back to the East Bay. They hit us on the way back across on BART the train had pulled out of Embarcadero Station and into the tunnel, the new one, all shiny and well-lit, as befitted a defiant gesture against the terrorists who'd blown up the original. When it came to a stop and the conductor came on the intercom and crackled at an announcement about a brief delay. The belts of the Oakland PD officers who entered our car were hung with less lethals and networking gear, and each of them wore what looked, like, what looked a little like marksman's glasses with black rectangles of electronics on each temple. They were recording everything. As they moved down the car, slowly panning their glasses across each person's face, I could hear something in their gear buzzing every time they got a lock and a successful recognition, and then they'd move on. People reacted with careful, controlled neutrality. All conversations ceased. We looked at one another, Tanisha and Mar Marcus and Ange and I. They were getting closer. We were underground, underwater, in a train, in a tunnel. There was nowhere for us to go. If they were looking for us, they were gonna get us. They locked on Marcus, a brief pause. Those shooter's glasses had a little display in them too, I saw. 
these guys were glass holes, wearing dysfunctional tactical versions of the even more dysfunctional and long abandoned Google Glass glasses. Try saying that three times fast. Then they alighted on Tanisha. The cop stiffened like he'd been shocked. We all saw it. He was young, white, brown-haired, a little chubby, a baby face. His partner was older, South Asian, white sidewall haircut and skinny. The two of them closed in on us. Ma'am, white cop said to Tanisha, can we see some ID? Tanisha looked around the car. Everyone was watching us and trying not to let it show. A couple of people, young guys, had their phones out and were recording. That was gutsy and maybe stupid. I could see Marcus wanted to get his phone out, but he kept it in his pants. Am I under arrest? Like a bust card come to life. Marcus was pale now. I knew his story. My guess was that he was reliving a specific bad moment out of his past, and I had an idea of which one. Not yet. Whitey was a comedian. His partner didn't like that. Am I being detained? That was the next bust card question. The one after that was, am I free to go, which would be hilarious, given where we were. We'd like to check your ID, ma'am. You're legally required to identify yourself. The older guy was trying to keep everything cool. He could feel those cell phone cameras drilling into his back. I think you're supposed to show him ID, Ange said. The older cop gave her a tight smile. Tanisha slowly reached inside her jacket. They both tensed up and so we tensed up and so everyone who was watching tensed up too and drew out her wallet with two fingers, opened it and brought out a California non-driver ID. We used to tease her about being the only one of us who never wanted to learn to drive. The young cop took it, examined both sides, and tapped it to a reader on his belt. Seconds crawled. We heard the buzz in both cop systems. We'd like you to come with us, please. The old guy said it calmly and in a voice, in a voice tone pitched to Carrie, talking for the camera phones as much as for Tanisha. Am I under arrest? She was so calm, calmer than I'd be. I wondered if it was the first time she'd been arrested. I hadn't thought to ask. You are being detained. I invoke my right to counsel. I invoke my right to silence. I do not consent to a search of my person or belongings. She said them like a mantra, loudly, crisply, like a manifesto. One of the guys recording her whooped. Someone clapped a little. It was a hell of a performance, an underwater civics lesson delivered in a crowded tin can. The cops nodded like they'd heard it before. I'm sure they had. We all looked at each other like, are we gonna let them lead her off? I'd like to accompany her, Marcus said. Can I see your ID? Marcus swallowed. This was clearly gonna go around and around in circles. Marcus could grandstand for days. I held up my hand at him and took out my own ID, not nearly as slowly as Tanisha had, but still avoided getting gunned down where I sat. The young guy took it, nearly fumbled it, scanned it. Whatever data came up, it was more than would fit on his stupid little heads up display because he took out his phone and scrolled for a while, conferring with his partner. Everyone stared at me, everyone. I was someone the cops had to whisper about before deciding their next move. You're staying, the young one said. People stared harder. I was a snitch, an undercover, a diplomat, an FBI, the president's niece. I'm going, my mouth was dry. I'm going and I'll either follow you until you cuff me or I'll come along quietly and not get in the way. The young one rolled his eyes. You're under arrest for obstruction. He began to recite my rights. Numbly, I held my hands out for the cuffs. The old one made a twirling motion, and I turned around and put my wrists together behind my back. The cuffs were plastic, tight, but not painful. Maybe one of my little groups said something. I couldn't hear over the roaring of the blood in my ears. What the actual fuck was I doing? The old one led me. The young one took niche. She wasn't in cuffs. We walked through the car, and the cop said something to the, to the conductor, who quietly asked the passengers one-on-one -on -one to clear out. They retreated to the other end of the car. The train jolted to a start. Its motion made me to remember to say, I'm invoking my right to silence. I'm invoking my right to an attorney. I do not consent to a search. Tanisha gave me an unreadable look. And the young cop rolled his eyes so hard that they fell out and onto the dirty carpet of the parked car. Our friends stood at the front of the crowd at the other end of the car. We're getting you a lawyer, Ange called after us. Marcus was tapping furiously on his phone. We have their badge numbers. Ange's voice carried remarkably well over the sound of the wheels starting to move again. All right, so that's the reading. And, and I had a couple of questions to kick off our discussion of the theme tonight, which is uh, race, gender, intersectionality, and the history of surveillance. And Malkia, 
I first met you at the Pioneer Awards for EFF, where I saw you talk briefly but powerfully about the historic relationship of contemporary digital surveillance to older forms of surveillance, including things like COINTELPRO and, uh, and surveillance going back to um, Jim Crow and the pre-Civil War slavery era. And I wondered if you could talk a little about that now and, and kind of give us that uh, context. Okay, well, thank you, first of all. It's good to be here with you all. And, um, you know, I've spent the last uh, four years first taking care of my wife who then passed away in 2018 um, and, and then caring for some other friends. And during that time, you know, that when, when my wife died, when my wife was diagnosed with cancer, it was 2016 and she was diagnosed uh, but maybe two weeks after Donald Trump had won the presidency. So this entire four years has really been, um, um, you know, I, I've watched kind of like the, the, the actions of the president also reflect in my own life, right? The, the, the level of deadliness, uh, the level of trauma, the level of pain. Now, I think that the same thing is true for Black people in general in terms of as we've watched, you know, the, the um, growth of the surveillance state, as we've watched, you know, the growth of, of policing, we can root, we can root that um, deeply in our history. This is a fundamental part of our experience in the United States of America. We have like, people like author um, Simone Brown, who suggests in her book, Dark Matters, that blackness functions as a key site through which surveillance is practiced, narrated, and enacted. Um, and, and, you know, and what I take from that is this idea that racial capitalism um, is mediated by surveillance technologies and, and, and policies. We have, you know, we can go, we can go all the way back, right? Lantern laws um, in, the eight, you know, in the 18th century in New York City, <laughs> And I have to apologize, I have two kittens <laughs> that, that will not be contained in any room, so you will experience them, trust and believe that. But, uh, you know, lantern laws that, um, that demanded that black and uh, mixed race, indigenous, enslaved people carry candle lanterns with them as they walked around the city after sunset, um, if they were not in the company of a white person. Um, you know, any white person was deputized to stop black people, and if they didn't have a, a candle lit, um, and that's not just true in New York City, right? Those were laws that were true across the country uh, during slavery. Uh, you know, a black person had to be accompanied by a white person or given permission by a white person to move about. This is a function, you know, surveillance has always functioned to separate one from the other, the citizen from the slave, the, the you know, the uh, indefined national borders. I mean, that has been the purpose of, of surveillance from its, from its start. And these technologies that we're dealing with today, they have their roots in, that, in, that, in the slave past, in the lantern laws. Um, and we, we understand that like, you know, I mean, even branding, you know, um, you know, all of the laws from the black codes, you know, after reconstruction, all the way through segregation, all of these rules, which we don't think about as surveillance rules, as surveillance policies, but they are. They are, they are rules to monitor and watch Black people as they move through the world and control how we move through the world. You know, the FBI, you know, um, has a long history uh, of, of exercising those rules, you know, um, you know, from monitoring civil rights and Black liberation leaders like Fannie Lou Hamer, Ella Baker, Martin Luther King, Junior or, or Black Muslim leaders like Malcolm X and immigrant leaders like Marcus Garvey. We understand that it, you can be any type of Black person, you're going to get monitored, you know? And this repression of Black descent, you know, whether we're talking about, you know, the way my mother was, uh, was surveilled by the counterintelligence program or the FBI, um, otherwise known as COINTELPRO, her, her comrades in the Black Panther Party, um, you know, this covert government program was started in um, 1956, I believe, to monitor and disrupt the activities of the Communist Party, right, in the United States. Um, it, it, it interfered with the labor movement. Um, it interfered with, black, with, with the movement for civil rights and black power. But, but, but its focus, in large measure, very quickly became black dissent. You know, its activities were often illegal, they expanded in the 1960s to focus 
heavily on black activists and the civil rights and black power movements. And this is kind of the, you know, when we talk about black extremism, when we talk about how today the FBI has a des designation of racial uh, identity extremists, you know, or racially motivated identity extremists. I don't remember how they changed it, but they kicked it off with a black, with black identity extremism, right? That's the, you know, that's what they, they, they launched in 2018, that designation. By 2019, they had made a switch to call it racially motivated, you know, um, extremism. You know, th this is part of that long history. You know, this program is part of the, it, it, it emerges out of the COINTELPRO history, you know. The counterintelligence program, you know, did things like set people up to be in conflicts with the police. It did things like put a snitch jacket, as they would call it, on somebody, you know, to uh, make people believe that they had um, told the police something they hadn't. Um, in fact, it, it got so bad that, you know, they would make, they made, I won't name names, but, you know, they, they, they definitely created conflict between um, my mom and, 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 and another member of the Black Panther Party to the point where a hit was put out on her life, you know? 20 years later, when, they, when pe that person got their Freedom of Information Act papers and they saw that this was an FBI invention, you know, that it was a fiction created by the FBI, there had to be a healing, you know, and a, and a coming together. But this is what has happened, you know, Black Panthers and, and Black civil rights leaders, you know, had no idea that the state could be so vicious, you know, had no idea that the state would be so, so um, intent in terms of its surveillance practices, but we learned, um, we learned, and, I, and we as their children learn, learned as well. You know, two weeks before my mother died in 2005 from sickle cell anemia, the police came, the FBI came, excuse me, and literally broke our door um, trying to get my mother to, uh, to try to deliver a subpoena um, to my mother to testify um, in, a, in a court case. My mother couldn't walk, you know, my mother was in hospice. Uh, this is the experience that we have with the FBI uh, and, and with, and with the, those who are charged with enforcing surveillance. So we understand that today, as, the, as, we've, as we've emerged into this technological, you know, this high tech space, you know, as we have drones overhead, as we have, you know, cell site interceptors uh, monitoring us at protests or being used to track undocumented people, you know, as we have facial recognition technology, we know half of the nation is already in a facial recognition database. We have all this data mining. We know that, you know, Facebook and Twitter, but especially Facebook, are being used to target black voters, you know, with disinformation, to foment white supremacy. All this technology is built on top of a racist surveillance state. And it is used to, to enforce that racism and define those lines of white supremacy. So that is the history. And that is how the history brings us to where we are today. Thank you, Malkia. That was amazing. And I'm sorry, I didn't know about your wife until just now. I, I mean, life comes at you fast, but that's heartbreaking. I'm, I'm really, really sorry. Uh, thanks for letting us know and for sharing it. Meredith, um, you know, I, I've, I've known you through many different um, uh, phases of your activist career, uh, and you've been so effective in so many of them. But the one that I wanted to talk to you about, at least for openers tonight, was the work you did with the tech worker uprising, which ultimately led to tens of thousands of Googlers walking out of, of Google, but also uh, the, I think, Spawn, the, the Tech Won't Build It movement and Tech Solidarity and the workers at other tech companies who refuse to work on facial recognition or ICE surveillance or other parts of, of repressive surveillance uses of technology. And, and I wondered if you could talk about, again, the history of how that came about and where that momentum has taken us and what parts of it you feel are uh, exciting and what parts of it you feel have not lived up to their promise. And I know that's not your area of focus now. So I, I appreciate that you might be uh, slightly like uh, away from the coal face, but you certainly know more about that stuff than I do. So I'd love to get your, your uh, two cents on it. Thank you so much, Corey, for having me. And Malkia, that was just 
fabulous and thank you for that framing. Um, I want to start by just, you know, making it clear that the fact that you sort of know about me and I was even in a position to be part of a kind of a, a public face of this is, is part of my privilege. There were so many people who were doing work but weren't safe for, you know, they were on visas or they were supporting their family or other reasons that kind of coming out in front wasn't possible. So I just want to give a big shout out to all of the people who were doing as much work as I was uh, and who were, you know, certainly leaders in, in these efforts. It's, it's hard to tell those stories, um, but um, I, want to, I want to send my respect there. And I want to start by kind of picking up actually on the sort of, you know, the, the comment that Malkia made around, you know, we have drones, you know, surveilling protesters, we have, um, you know, we have, you know, tracking and surveillance and, um, and monitoring of immigrant communities um, at the border and in, in the US, et cetera. You, we have these sort of technologically mediated forms of, um, you know, of, of, of the you know, kind of the carceral state. Um, and my, you know, and kind of my story intersects there around the, the organizing I did at Google and beyond because I was, you know, before then I was kind of a, a public voice, right? I spoke out critically around technology that was part of kind of like a critical industrial complex, if you will, that like spoke pretty, you know, I was often very opposed to the company party line. I often took views that were, you know, um, that were controversial in the company, but I was, you know, I was celebrated for that work, right? So it seemed, you know, it seemed pretty cool, right? I could do all of this research. I could be out on stage saying like, I think Google is wrong, right? And that was fine. Um, but, you know, what I recognized as happening over time is that I was sort of, you know, I was, I had no real power, right? So what I contributed to was a view from the outside, at least, and I think within Google to a certain extent, that there was a, a rousing debate, that they were taking all perspectives into account, that these were actually sort of views that they accounted for. But then when the decisions were made, the door was closed and, you know, they were making those decisions irrespective of my, um, my input, my research, the force of my argument, right? And so it was a it was kind of a personal embodied lesson, right? Power doesn't move based on force of argument and specifically this type of like neoliberal racial capitalist power that these, these companies are, are constituted around. Um, and that was around the time I found out about the uh, contract that Google had with the Department of Defense through an intermediary to provide artificial intelligence targeting and surveillance systems for the US drone program. Um, you know, it, it turns out today we learned that the, the Customs and Border Patrol were flying predator drones over Black Lives Matter protesters, right? So we can't actually separate these. Imperial technology will always come back to the center, right? And this is a racial project, um, you know, whether it's happening in Yemen or whether it's happening in Baltimore or San Francisco. Um, so I think, I think that, was, that was my first um, kind of reckoning with myself, right? If I'm making my name on this, if I am you know, I'm kind of gaining clout. I'm part of this, you know, these people who go around and talk on panels about this, but I'm not actually kind of putting some skin in the game, game and figuring out like, how do we build power to, you know, reverse this decision? Um, I'm not, you know, I'm not clear what I'm actually doing. I think I'm, you know, I'm actually contributing to the problem by providing the, the facade of, you know, a sufficient um, solution without actually grappling with that. So that was around the time that I started taking organizing seriously and realizing that we weren't, um, we weren't going to be able to push back on these, these decisions. We weren't going to be able to push back on this sort of increasing wedding of these massive companies with extraordinary power in some cases that extends beyond the power of, you know, individual nation states and a, you know, the U.S. empire that was sort of spiraling into kind of, you know, racist authoritarianism and that is something you know it terrifies me today it terrified me then um so we started organizing and it was an experiment right like can we use these techniques to push back against this decision um and that you know that sort of that catalyzed a whole number of things including i think a a kind of place where a lot of people were who were feeling increasingly uncomfortable about the role of tech um could put their energies um and i think you know what i want to connect here is that you know, there was, we had the Google walkout and that was really, that was focused a lot on um, racism and misogyny within the cultures of these companies. Um, and particularly the racialized line between contract workers who were paid, you know, they're, they're not paid well, they don't have job security, they don't have health insurance um, and full-time workers, which is, you know, like 
it's, it's extremely clear if you look at those demographics exactly what's happening there, um, that those racialized lines and the sort of racist um, and, and imperialist purposes to which these, the technologies that Google was, was building were put. So it's really, you know, it's a question of who has power, who's making these determinations, who's benefiting from these technologies because there are beneficiaries from, you know, racial regimes and who is paying the cost, who gets to use these technologies, who are they used on. Um, so we, you know, we've organized across a number of axes for a, a long time. And I think, you know, I think part of what happened is now we have sort of a common sense toolbox, right? You know, workers walk out, there's a sort of, you know, there is an, a responsibility that a lot of folks are beginning to feel around their role in these infrastructures. And I want to say this is, you know, you're looking at organizing that is also happening, you know, outside of these companies, it's very deeply wedded. I would see like the campaigns that Media Justice ran around um, around facial recognition bans that were extraordinarily successful that sort of tied in with some of the consciousness raising at these companies. The No Tech for ICE campaign that Mi Gente and other uh, immigrant rights groups have been pushing for a long time that are sort of linked up with workers. And you know, in that case, I think it's actually you know, a lot of the leadership is coming from outside the companies, but then people who have, you know, particular expertise on a given system or, or what have you is, are, are contributing as well. So, you know, my vision is not, you know, tech workers who can demand more food in the micro kitchen, right? My vision is for something where you have social movements that are actually leading, recognizing that these technologies, you know, knowledge about these technologies don't exist in one room or another. You need to understand, you know, the lived experience first and then sort of recognize, okay, how do we respond to that um, with respect um, in, in an ethical way and make changes, including refusing to build this technology, including the work, refusing to work for these companies, including striking, including what have you. So I'll stop there. That was fantastic, Meredith. I have to say the uh, out of control kitten makes such an amazing counterpoint <laughs> to the really heavy stuff. I, I think we needed for all of these, uh, it's the like the bathotic, uh, you know, bathos, like the, the, the two different moods juxtaposed. We need, we need more of that in these heavy discussions. So uh, Attack Surface is a novel about a uh, techie having a uh, moral reckoning. And one of the things that I have always uh, uh, believed, maybe naively, is this idea that, um, the thing that makes people fall in love with technology, especially the kinds of technologists who came out of an era before there was a big industry. You know, my dad, when he became a programmer, became someone who helped like predict the weather and then became a computer science teacher, right? Those were the glamorous careers of people who did applied mathematics, right? Which is what we used to call computer science. And the people who got there didn't get there because they were thinking about becoming rich. They got there because they took a computer and they expressed what they wanted it to do very crisply and the computer did it perfectly. And then they found a network and they, they found people who could articulate things that had been inchoate inside themselves. They found communities, they found ways to, to network across worlds, both figuratively and literally. And that self-determination and that, that power to form communities is so intoxicating and I, and then I look and I see that their bosses want them to build stuff to take that away from other people. And I have to think that if there is a case to be made to technologists who, as you say, if they don't build it, sometimes it won't happen, right? In, in, in some domains, tech talent is in such short supply that like, like Oppenheimer, if Oppenheimer had said, no, I'm not building the bomb, they could have found other nuclear physicists and they could have found other uh, managers but they were really short on nuclear phys physicists who are great managers, right? He might, we might not have had a bomb or at least not the bomb we got and not when we got it. If Oppenheimer had decided that the time to start quoting the Bhagavad Gita and thinking about his regrets was before he detonated the first bomb and attack surface tries to talk to those people. And I guess my question for both of you, we've talked about the role of, of um, people who are seeking to push back against technological power, but is there anything at all we want from the companies or the people who work there apart from them to be broken up, made smaller, made less powerful? Is there, is there an intermediate harm reduction phase between you know, restoring the internet to a place that isn't five giant websites filled with screenshots of text from the other four? And, and, and like now, is there an intermediate step where we say that that is a thing that if the tech companies did it, the world would be better? 
I would say, look, the way I, the way I would answer that question is that um, while some technologists experience technology like art, um, it has always been subverted to the demands of whatever economy it, it's being created in. And so, um, you know, I don't believe that the, you know, t the tech, the tech companies, they are the ultimate, you know, um, conscription of like the negative elements of tech, right? So they, you know, once you have built a company in a capitalist economy under a state, under a white supremacist state, the company can only carry out certain functions. It cannot carry out other functions. And so I think that, um, you know, this idea of harm reduction is real um, in that public pressure to, um, to reduce the, to, to mitigate impacts, to reduce harms, to improve material conditions are important, but it's really important that we understand that that is a step. It's never the goal, you know? Hmm. There, there is a, I mean, some people are like, don't be reformist. I'm not, that's not where I come from. I'm from like, there are revolutionary reforms and there are regressive reforms. And, you know, we need to decide when it comes to technology, what are the revolutionary reforms that actually get us to the next state versus what are the regressive reforms that simply mitigate our current material conditions. And I think that's, you know, that's why it's so important to break those companies up, not because we want them to function when they're smaller, but because it actually, if you're, if you're a person like me who believes in 21st century socialism, who believes in black liberation, who believes in, you know, the rights of all people to migrate and all, you know, these kinds of uh, belief systems, then, then what you end up wanting is, is not just smaller companies. Um, you want an entirely different economy, an entirely different form of state. And, and the only way to get there, the only way to get to a state that protects human rights, that respects civil rights, that, that uh, in which the, we don't have the kind of economic stratification we're in today is, is to, to take certain reform steps. And one of those steps is antitrust. You know, that is a step in that direction. It's not the goal. So I would answer, I don't think there are that many things you can do. But whatever you can do, those, the, whatever limited things you can do, those are things on the way. My mother always used to tell me there's a strategy for now and a strategy for later, you know? And so we need to figure out both at the same time. Yeah, I, I, I recognize that, uh, that rhetoric. You know, I was raised by Promethean commie lefties who are also technologists and we would go visit my grandparents in Florida and go to Disney World and my dad would walk around and say, imagine this under people's ownership, right? Imagine this, this technological wonder owned by the workers who operate it. Uh, you know, it's not a coincidence that that is the plot of my first novel. Um, Meredith, did you have any thoughts on, on what the companies can do or, or what harm reduction looks like? I'm just, you know, snapping along with Malky. I agree with all of that. And I think, you know, under capitalism, under racial capitalism is the question, what could they do when they are beholden to a set of incentives that is a, a kind of a, a fantasy of growth forever without uh, secession, right? Like it is, you know, we're, we're looking at as sort of the death logic of our planet right now. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that is ultimately the, to use sort of machine learning language, the objective function of these companies. Everything else is sort of pruning around the edges. And I, you know, I do know individuals within these companies who do, you know, they put their heart and sometimes get it broken trying for tiny little reforms, right? Like put themselves in the way of a feature push or, you know, a bad decision. Um, and I don't, you know, I don't want to sweat that. Like I, everyone also needs a job and that's another complication around the sort of discussion of what should workers do. Right. Um, but I do think, you know, I would agree with everything Malkia said, and maybe I'll add some, just, you know, just some things I think about, particularly around the antitrust solution, because I think oftentimes when we see antitrust proposed, it's not, you know, it's by people who are expert in antitrust, not expert in building large scale infrastructure. Right. And what I worry about is that the, the constitutive logic of these systems is a sort of 
view from above. It's gather as much data that is as fungible as possible on infrastructure that is as interoperable as possible, right? So cutting that up does not perturb that logic, right? And so I think, you know, I've, I've used the metaphor of like cutting up a starfish, right? So exactly how are we how are we dividing, you know, how are we redistributing power, I think is the question, not simply how are we carving out the bookstore from the, you know, whatever the, the logistics arm from, et cetera, because I think we, you know, we're running into kind of a baby bells paradox with that. So I, you know, I, I agree with all of that. And I think also I want to be really careful that we're not looking at like reformist antitrust um, right. and, and actually, you know, we're looking at power. How do we, you know, how do we redistribute this power? And one thing I would say is we also need a lot more whistleblowers right now. Like we don't have any, we have so little information on where this tech is actually used and by whom, um, specifically around their like reselling of AI models, the reselling of infrastructure and other things. Um, and those contracts, those you know contracts between these big companies and every single startup in the world that uses their their infrastructure, all these government functions, all, you know, it's these private businesses that are repackaging facial recognition, et cetera. Like those are some of the most protected documents in those companies. So I think like, like that would be, you know, open that up, like um, some kind of WikiLeaks would be a, a suggestion hmm. I have on top of that. that that's a, you know a, it's a fact, sorry, go ahead. No, I just wanted to just, co you know, yes, 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 right on all of that. And I love that extra point about redistributing power. I just wanted to say a word about the, the good people, you know, the good people in tech. Um, it's kind of like the good white people, you know, it's like they're out there for sure, but um, but the function of white supremacy doesn't change just because they're good, you know? Um, and, and so I think it's important for us to think about like, you know, tech, the tech companies are either neoliberal or fascist. Once you are a company in, in this country, you can't be a revolutionary company in that way. You, there's other forms that you can take. You can take the co-op, you can take the, you know, there's other, other forms of, of uh, there's other economic forms you can take to move, towards, uh, to move towards radicalism. But if you're a company in the traditional American sense of that, then you are either neoliberal or you're fascist. And the neoliberal, I have to say, to me is sometimes even more dangerous than the fascist because the fascist is obvious, whereas the neoliberal is not, you know? And we got a lot of good people in these neoliberal companies, Facebook is a neoliberal company, for example, mm -hmm. where it carries out one agenda, but it's people that are there. They have a, they they might be progressive on a domestic level in some ways. You know, they believe in same-sex marriage or they believe in you know whatever. But at the same time, what they actually carry out in in their activities supports actual fascism. So mm -hmm. this is the this is the struggle I think we also have to be in. That. I, I, I'm on board with that. Meredith, I want to talk a little about, uh, about antitrust and breakups because this is an area I've been really digging into. It's most of my work these days at EFF is, is on antitrust and breakups and what's happening in Europe right now and, and what's happening here. And I do think that there's like one power dynamic that's underexplored here, which is the extent to which there is not, the, there, there is a, there, when, when industries get consolidated, they find class solidarity. Right. If you know, people look at the tech leaders sitting around the table with Trump in 2016 at the top of Trump Tower, and they're appalled that they're meeting with Trump, which is appalling enough. But equally appalling is that they fit around one table. And when you all fit around one table, it means two things. One is that your companies have excess rents, right, that you can extract uh, and then and then mobilize, not just as dividends to shareholders, but also for carrying out uh, political projects. And when there's only six of you, you can figure out what you need to do. Right, you can you can come to an agreement about what you want, and so my feeling is that nerfing the tech companies, shattering the tech companies, will deprive them of the consensus. Right, that it'll just make it harder for them to not stab each other in the back. It's not that they'll be our friends; it's that they'll be each other's enemies. Right, and you know we see this with telecoms, where you have telecoms companies that don't even follow the logic of capital. You know, Frontier when it it went bankrupt at the start of the plague, dumped its docks. And so we got to see how they were running the business. One of the things we learned is that there were 3 million US families that they projected they could uh, profitably connect to 100 gigabit fiber and earn $800 million in profit from that they chose not to connect up because the amortization schedule was 10 years and their executive suite were paid in shares. And the analysts whose reports controlled their share price always downrank companies whose amortization schedule is more than five years. So now there's 3 million American households who are like 
getting their health and their education and their employment and everything else through like copper wires wrapped in newspaper, dipped in gutta percha and draped over shrubs. And the shareholders of this company didn't get $800 million, right? Like it's, it's it, you know, talk about a, 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 a toxic mix. And so, you know, I'm not a believer that markets solve all our problems, but like, it seems to me that a more functional market would have delivered a better, like one where Frontier actually had to compete would have delivered a better outcome to those 3 million households and even to his shareholders. Yeah, I, I will, I want to caveat this very strongly. I'm not an antitrust expert, so I would look to like Sanjeev Paul and Marshall Steinbaum and others who you know, think on the left about this uh, really mm -hmm. deeply. Um, I do, you know, I, I do think there is a lot of the way in which these companies have sort of created and captured markets um, is not always obvious, right? Like I think about the work that I did around net neutrality like a thousand years ago. Um, and when I realized that Google's network, like it's, you know, it, its network was bigger than Comcast in the US, but nobody knew that because it didn't have to sort of disclose that. But that was one of the reasons Google was so fast that everyone wants to use Google infrastructures, that they have, you know, a, a network of um, kind of content delivery modules that make sure YouTube works faster than any other site anywhere you are, because it preloads like the top 100 YouTube videos in that, you know, in that region or, or what have you. So there's a lot of, I think we need to step back from simply like, we need more than six dudes at a table. That is clear, right? <laughs> in any constellation of power. And Cheryl, you're talking about six the dudes and Cheryl. And Sarah, yeah, and like one girl boss, whatever. Like they're all patriarchs, right? Um, and, um, but I think, you know, I think we also have to recognize that a lot of the expectations that we have been sort of trained to expect around how technology works, how this thing, I'm holding up my cell phone for anyone who's um, um, not looking, um, works, right? Like how these things function and shape and mod modulate our daily lives and our communities are based on these concentrations of power. And I think like we have to be willing to be like, okay, how do we reshape that, right? What other social modalities can we build in the absence of something that works like this, but has so many, um, but is, you know, but is ultimately like a, a pernicious force in our lives. Um, yeah, so I don't know if we have any questions yet. They, they haven't migrated into our box, uh, but I will keep asking questions until they show up there. Audience members, if you have questions, uh, the interface that you're using, which is not the interface that we're using, we're using an exotic piece of software that most people don't get to use called Zoom, that only the people backstage get to see. You're using something far more quotidian. But if you want to add your questions there, I want to ask as a last question before we get audience questions here, um, what is the role of anti-surveillance in justice struggles? Encryption, dazzle, um, all of the things that we talk about as technical countermeasures for resistance. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I don't wanna, like, like obviously the kind of cartoonish cypherpunk thing where we'll just build an, a demimond that lives alongside an oppressive regime and is protected by cryptography is silly because someone will eventually tie you to a chair and hit you with a rubber hose until you tell them what your passphrase is. But is there any role? Like what is, and what parts of it are important and, and how can we uh, upregulate the parts that are doing good and downregulate the parts that aren't? You know, I'm not a technologist, so um, I can only speak as a, as a movement activist, you know. And I think that the issue with um, these kind of defensive technology, I mean, you always need a strategy for self-defense. Absolutely, you know, and I think that, you know, having a standard of encryption is absolutely necessary. Um, I think, though, that encryption, uh, I hope that encryption does not make people think that they, they information is safe, um, because it isn't, you know, it's, it's just more safe than it is if it wasn't encrypted, you know what I mean? That's, that's very different than it being safe and, and secure. Um, and so I think, you know, first of all, just understanding that what security even means, you know what I mean? That it doesn't mean that everything is perfectly safe. I think, you know, the other issue um, is scale. You know, I, I, I believe that, you know, these types of technologies, they can't be delivered at scale. I mean, many of the um, kind of infringements on, on um, the digital, the technological infringements on privacy, they, they emerged as uh, tactics during the, as part of the war on drugs, you know, and, and these uh, anti-gang, you know, and anti, 
crime, you know, uh, frame, frame that way, um, t tactics, you know, um, were widespread and, and for, moved far beyond the war on drugs, but the, in, the defensive strategies, encryption and other kinds of technologies, they do not have that scale and they do not reach the people who are often targeted by, the, by those technologies. So I think that you have a mismatch here. I think if you're talking about activists, high profile activists, absolutely. You know, I think these technologies provide some measure of safety. You know, when, you deal, when you're dealing with that kind of a threat assessment, when you're dealing with a mass threat assessment, not an individual one, I think that these technologies don't provide um, uh, safety and security to the vast majority of the people. I think that, you know, if you live in a housing project, 90% of them people who are being targeted by various types of surveillance technologies, they're not gonna be protected by encryption. There's no way to, to, to produce that at mass scale unless you, you put, I mean, I think there's one piece around passing policy that, that requires a certain level of encryption at the, at, the, uh, you know, at the site of production. So like on your phone, you know, if you have a, if you have a um, uh, not an iPhone, but you know, you have uh, other kinds of phones, you know, Google phone or whatever, that, that it's required that that have a certain level of encryption. Like the, there are ways to get to scale on that, but for the most part, I don't see that happening now. So I think that, that those are some of the concerns that I would have is like reaching scale, you know, really thinking about um, the, the mass targeting and who's being targeted and whether or not those individuals will actually be able to, to use any of that stuff. How sophisticated do you need to be to be able to use any of these technologies? You know what I'm saying? Like all of that is some of what, what comes up. And even for me, like, you know, um, I have basic levels of, of security on, on all of my stuff. And there's certain things that we can mass line. We can mass line two factor. We can mass line, like there's various things that you can put out there, but that's not being done right now. You know, I haven't seen a wide scale, mm massive public education campaign around security, around digital security for the masses of people. I only see it in the smaller activist circles, which is great, but it's insufficient because, you know, if, even if you are say, my, what about my sister? You know what I'm saying? What about my cousin? And, uh, and I know from the counterintelligence program days that it's not just about you, it's about everybody you interact with, you know? And so if you are securing yourself, but your people are not secure, then you're not secure. So I think that, that these, are all some, these are all the things that I think about when, when asked that question. That's, that's a great answer. I know that one of the people watching tonight is my friend Ken Snyder, who administers the mail server I use in Toronto and also uh, the, the Tor relay that Boing Boing operates. Uh, and who is briefly the CTO of Wikimedia and is a very, very good network administrator. And I feel really safe about his mail server and I use encryption for my mail and I take the mail off the server with pop. And so it sits on my laptop and not on the server. So even if someone were to seize the server and break the encryption, it wouldn't be there. But of course, everyone I send email to is on Gmail and none of them have GPG. And so it's all sitting in the clear on Google server. And so it really doesn't matter how secure I am if they're not secure. Uh, Meredith, you founded a nonprofit that I advise called Simply Secure that, that is trying to do some of this work. And I thought you might have some good thoughts on this as well. Yeah, I think the only thing I would add there is that a lot of the encryption conversation that I've been part of with crowds of technologists sort of, again, focuses on the sort of individual um, agency, right? That, you know, people you know, not only should, but like, if they don't, there's, you know, a problem, um, you know, take into their own hands, the security and privacy of their, their communications. And I think, you know, Malkia and, and you, Corey, just kind of deconstructed a very good reason why that, that isn't really possible, um, you know, in a lot of cases. I think, I think another one is that in so many cases, and increasingly, I, I see, we are not the users of this technology, we're the subjects. Right. So if you are in, you know, across the street from me, there is a large um, housing complex, right? And there are huge NYPD vans with like, you know, basically Klieg lights and, you know, surveillance cameras on 24 seven on that courtyard. That's not something, you know, encryption is not going to solve that, right? We walk by mm -hmm. sensors every day. You know, I am, you know, I'm being assessed and 
modeled and predicted against based on huge amounts of aggregate data you know, co collected by other people, it doesn't matter if I have contributed my data, right? They're going to see, you know, whatever, whatever data inputs I give them, however scanty, they're going to be able to make an assessment about me that may or may not be true, but the truth of that doesn't, doesn't ease its, mm -hmm. its implications for me. And again, you know, all of that is, is racialized. All of that is sort of policing that racialized boundary in a way that is sort of, you know, kind of naturalizing it. Um, and, uh, and, and I think making it um, kind of entrenching, entrenching these logics um, across our, our institutions and the technologies they use. We have an audience question from either Wouter Lagerweil or Ovij or Wouter Lagerweij, uh, who wants to know if there is an intermediate step or an incremental step uh, that we could take in respect of the current tech monopolies that would uh, improve the situation even if we didn't, uh, even if, the, if that wasn't the complete solution, or do we just have to dismantle them? I have an answer for this, but I want to know your guys' answers. I mean, there's always intermediate steps, you know, like there's never, there's never an, an option to go from zero to 60. That doesn't happen. So what happens in between zero and 60 are things like grassroots activism to, um, you know, to, in, in, to pass policies that restrain, you know, some of these companies, um, to ban some of their behavior, you know what I mean? Um, to, I mean, once technology is produced, you can't eliminate it. It's there, it's in the world, but you can ban its use, you know? Um, and so banning the use of various technologies. In the case of a, of an, of a company like Facebook, constant expo exposés, constant whistleblowing, constantly because part of their, their function is they function in secret you know the things they do work best when nobody knows about them and so you know uh FOIA requests and you know all kinds of he public hearings um you know but also and then there's the direct corporate accountability um strategy you know where we for the since 2000 and wow since 2014 we've been pressuring Facebook to do a variety of things you know uh, we pressured them to, um, to, to, to develop a strategy to remove white supremacists from their, from their site. Um, and they, have begun, they had begun to do so. I mean, but but this, these are ongoing fights, you know, all of the people out here fighting, you know, and Media Justice is one of those organizations around voter suppression on the you know, that the company is responsible for. Or I could go on and on and on, right? But the point is that there are corporate accountability campaigns to, to but each one of those, each one of the strategies I've just dictated, they will, um, their job is to restrain, constrain. They can't actually change the dynamics. What they can do is build power over time, you know? And that's the goal. It's like, but we, you know, you constrain the company, you build the people. Constrain the company, build the people and cyclically over time. And then at some point you get a big leap forward. You know what I mean? Like an opportunity comes to leap forward in a major way. And that's kind of how I think strategically we think about um, change in, in, in terms of these companies. That's, that's my two Thank cents. Thank you. That's awesome. Meredith. Yeah, what Melchior said. Um, I think, you know, <laughs> the, the target is not gradualism, right? The target is, you know, what the, the the questioner puts as kind of a revolutionary goal, right? But there are, you know, there are campaigns that um, can tie their hands, that can sort of prevent certain bad actions, that can, you know, make one choice less painful than the other. And then when the opportunity comes, you just need to be ready. Um, and I do, you know, I do think this is, you know, we're looking at impending um, climate crisis. We're looking at a lot of things that are going to heighten a lot of these contradictions quickly. So there are going to be both those moments of crisis and you know those moments where um, of opportunity um, um, forthcoming. I predict. Yeah, absolutely. So I have a couple more technocratic uh, uh, approaches to weakening their power. So one would be a federal privacy law with a private right of action. That means that it's against the law for them to abuse your privacy and you don't have to wait for the attorney general to sue them, you get to sue them. And if you combine that with statutory damages where you don't have to show harm, it's just enough that they that they violated your privacy and you, you get a payday and you get a loser pays regime where if you win, 
you get back your legal fees, then you have a recipe for a world in which uh, the bigger a company is and the deeper its pockets th there are, the more 1-800 lawyer, no win, no fee bar lawyer types there are who are just like, yeah, I will fund a lawsuit against Facebook for the next 10 years because when I get my payday in the loser pays regime, uh, that's gonna like put my kids through college. Like, why wouldn't I sue them for 10 years? The longer the lawsuit goes on, the better for me. They can't outspend me because I can always find investors because they know Facebook's good for it. And, and we can see that they abuse your privacy. So that's, that's one. When you look at the history of tech companies, you see that where they have hegemonic power like IBM had, that anything that we do to tie their legal hands to stop uh, technologists from weakening that power. So you leave intact their technological power to fight you, but you take away their legal power to fight you. That that is often sufficient to see an opening up in the market. So like IBM spent 12 years being sued for antitrust violations. The, every year that they were sued, they spent more money than the entire DOJ antitrust division on their lawyers for one case. After 12 years, the DOJ dropped the case, but they were heartbroken, right? They lost their nerve. So out comes the PC and they're like, we're not even going to try to make an operating system for it. We'll license some kid, you know, Bill Gates to make an operating system for it. We're not going to try to monopolize it because the DOJ doesn't like vertical integration. And then this, this queer punk technologist who lives a couple of miles from me, Tom Jennings, the guy who created Fidonet, gets hired by Phoenix Computers to reverse engineer the AT, construction, the, the AT instruction set uh, and their ROMs and to make a PC compatible ROM. And that's the basis for Gateway, Dell, every other PC company in America and in the world, right, was buying those ROMs that this, this one kid hacked together, right? Now, I'm not saying that it solved the problem. And in particular, it was the last hurrah of antitrust. So, you know, Meredith, you talked about the baby bells. I mean, you know, killing, the, killing Bell at least did one thing. It's, it ended Bell's war on the modem, right? The major uh, monopolistic tactic of Bell for the 10 years before the breakup was no modems for anyone. So like it did get us something, right? But it was also, there was also, you know, followed by 10 years in which the DOJ were like, oh, you want to buy all those companies we broke you into? That's fine with us. And, you know, like, like Voldemort sitting on the back of that guy's head and slowly reaccumulating his power 10 years later, they were back. But I think that if we got a muscular right to interoperate, Right, an interoperator's defense that says, notwithstanding any law, patents or copyright or trade secrecy or non-compete or whatever, notwithstanding any law, it is always lawful to make a new service or product that it plugs into an existing one in order to repair it, add accessibility, add privacy, make it work better for a bona fide user, that we get that and that there are a lot of things that co-ops and firms and individuals will do that will weaken their hegemony and open space in policy for more radical change. And that takes us to the hour. Uh, folks, it has been great. Uh, I see Lisa Yo has a, has a question in here. Um, I am going to uh, um, not answer it, although it's an excellent question. And instead, I'm going to close by saying that there are five more of these nights. Uh, if you go to attacksurface.com, you'll find them. Uh, we touch on many themes similar to this one. In particular, I think it'll be interesting to tune into the one with Chris Brown and, and Bruce Sterling about cyberpunk and post-cyberpunk. And um, each one of those you have to buy a ticket for, and it comes with a book. If you don't need the book, uh, I have assembled a list of library schools, halfway houses, prisons, classrooms that would like donated copies. And you just put their address in instead of your address, and they'll send that copy to them. And uh, if you just if you just like uh, go to craphound.com, it's like the third post in there. Uh, it's a, or or it's an easy search as well. Anyway, Malkia Meredith, I'm so proud and honored that I got you two on the line for an hour tonight. What a treat! Um, I feel edified and energized and um, and and just excited as heck that that you were here tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. It was lovely to be here with you both. Yes, thank you. I'm thank always, you, Evan. Uh, my pleasure. You, this was wonderful. You all are, are brilliant, and I feel uh, ten times smarter than I was before this uh, discussion. So, thank you all for that, and um, and uh, to all of you who are tuned in, thanks for for being here with us. Um, uh, if you want another copy of the book, uh, the the link is on the page, and um, hope we can all uh, meet together in person uh, soon-ish. But um, until then, hope to see you uh, again here soon. Um, take care. Wear a mask. Yes, please wear masks. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. Good night.